Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. Roy Cohn was for four decades an outsized but sinister figure on the American political scene. He believed that politics, stripped of pretense, is the dirty, unethical pursuit of power, which he would use to destroy his enemies. As a young lawyer, he helped send convicted atomic spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg to the electric chair. He bragged to Roger Stone that if I could have pulled the switch, I would have done it myself. Many lawyers now agree that the death sentence was disproportionate and even illegal. Others have argued that Cohn pressured the principal witness in the case to testify falsely. Cohn went on to become chief counsel to Senator Joe McCarthy, where he smeared reputations, sought preferred treatment for a close friend, and although a closeted homosexual, cynically used his power to ferret gays from the State Department. Later, he beat the system, escaping three times from the dragnet of legendary prosecutor Robert M. Morgenthau. His success in his own behalf made him a familiar player on the New York political scene, advising mobsters, Catholic prelates, and aspiring businessmen, including his star political apprentice, Donald Trump. With us is David Marcus. David Marcus roved the world for 30 years as a journalist. He has intimate knowledge about Cohn, recounted in recent articles in Politico and The Rap. He knows whereof he speaks, as he is Roy Cohn's cousin. I'm pleased to welcome Dave Marcus to this table. I'm not sure I like to be introduced as Roy Cohn's cousin, but we could say I'm a journalist who observed him, who happened to be related to him. Happened to be Roy Cohn's cousin. Well, tell us something about your relationship with Cohn. How well did you know him? Well, I, what happened was my father, his first cousin, despised Roy, and since the Rosenberg trial, the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg trial, which was really started in 1950, my dad refused to be in the same room with Roy Cohn. But when I was at Brown University, I was interested in American history. Roy knew it. Roy shaped it. Roy ruined it in many ways. And so I went to talk to Roy. And that continued for almost a decade as I interviewed him. And ultimately, I decided to follow him when he was dying of liver cancer, which turned out to be AIDS. So I spent a year going to Palm Beach, going to Greenwich, his house in Greenwich, going to New York, going elsewhere, going to parties, and watching him as he recounted his life and prepared for the end. So tell us a little bit about uh, Trump's beginnings. He was an only child. He was born in the Bronx. Uh, tell us about his parents. <laughs> You're making the mistake that my family makes. You said Trump. You mean Roy. But they're, I mean, in some ways, unfortunately, they're interchangeable. And actually, that's an interesting thing. They're both outer borough kids. They both were peering in the glass of Manhattan, the window. They wanted to make the big time. They wanted to be there. And any connection their fathers had, any connection their families had, anything they could do, they would do. So Roy's father married into my family, the Marcus family, which had some money in those days, and got a, an appointment to be a judge, a, uh, an appellate, a New York a Supreme Court appellate judge. And that gave Roy entree into society. And Roy was an only child who dined with politicians and judges and lawyers at age six and seven and eight and held court, little Prince Roy, as we called him. And that led him to learn some lessons about power, which he transferred to Trump, unfortunately, for the rest of us. Uh, now, based on his experience in the Rosenberg case, he became quite famously chief counsel to Senator McCarthy. And uh, tell us what you know about that. Basically, Roy used a personal vendetta. Roy had a friend named Dave, G. David Shine, who was traveling the world with him looking for communists. And Roy was a denouncing... Close friend. A, Yes, we're not sure how close, but we know they're close friends. And Roy was denouncing homosexual perverts in the State Department, in libraries overseas, in all government agencies. And at the same time, he was gay. I mean, you just said it yourself. Everybody knew it in those days even, but nobody talked about it. And ultimately, Roy's desire to protect his friend G. David Shine led to an explosive thing, which a lot of people would say was the first reality TV show. And in 1954, Roy should have been ruined. And, ex and G Senator Joseph McCarthy, the Republican senator he worked for, was ruined. But amazingly, Roy went on to another three decades of fame and power broking and, and fortune in his own way. It's, and, and a few years later, he met a young Donald Trump. After McCarthy was discredited, and um, you remember... Uh, Joseph Welsh's uh, rebuke to McCarthy, uh, have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you no sense of decency? Uh, Cohn left Washington. 
McCarthy was censured by the Senate, and he came to New York, and he kind of lit up the town in New York, didn't he? So tell about that. If you think about it, it makes no sense at all. The man, Roy Cohn, well, McCarthy died. Uh, I think he was drunk, and he died soon after. He was a ruined man. And Roy incredibly reinvented himself and became, as you said, a counselor to cardinals of the Catholic Church, to mafiosos, to developers. He was close to Mayor A. Beam when business necessitated. He knew judges. He was a lawyer, quote unquote, because he didn't really practice much law. He just did, he got, he did favors for people. George Steinbrenner was so a friend. He was a fixer. He was, a, he was the ultimate, ultimate fixer. Michael Cohn, who worked for Trump, Roger Stone, Bill Barr, all these people who, are, who have been in the news recently, they wish they could be the kind of fixers that Roy Cohn was, and Rudy Giuliani, too. Roy was, and I want to make sure that I'm clear about this, Roy was evil. He did anything it took. He didn't care if he was making a deal between a young developer and a mafia boss who, who was in charge of concrete unions and a union boss who was in charge of concrete people. You could guess which young developer I'm talking about. Now, uh, Cohn was, uh, uh, Trump was impressed with Cohn because uh, Cohn had beaten the system. He was indicted three times by legendary prosecutor Robert M. Morgenthau, and Morgenthau was unable to make it stick. Well, you think about the first meeting they had. That this, in a lot of ways, casts a die for what we're seeing today in Washington, what we're seeing writ large in the world. Cohn and Trump bumped into each other, into each other and Trump said, hey, I have this problem. It was in a bar, wasn't it? It was in a place called Lee Club. It was sort of where people went to be seen, and it was in Manhattan, and they were both preening like peacocks. But Roy had the center of attention. Trump was not well known. He was young. And Trump said, you know, I've heard about you. I've talked to all these lawyers, and the Department of Justice is going after me because they say, correctly, that I'm not letting African Americans, I'm not letting blacks in the apartment complexes I own in Queens and Brooklyn. And Roy said, forget these establishment lawyers. Don't make a deal with them. Go after them. And that started a conversation which resulted in Trump, Trump, who was guilty, suing the federal government for $100 million. Now, he ultimately did not win that suit, but that's a lesson from Roy. You deflect attention. You dodge. You divert. You, when you're attacked, you counterattack. And you always find somebody to blame. Those three things, we see that now, that was the 70s, we see that now in, you know, years later, decades well, later. and Cohn called a press conference with Trump, and they told the reporters all about uh, the lawsuit and why they'd counterclaimed in uh, their version of the case. Hmm. So you think about that. Using the media, or now social media, to distract attention, I wonder where that came from. Came was vintage Roy Cohn. Vintage Roy, I, I, his playbook is probably on every desk in the White House. I mean, I'm, virtually, I'm not saying there's a real one, but that was Roy. Don't admit you're wrong. Don't admit you're guilty. Attack other people. Go after scapegoats if you can find Mexican immigrants or in these days, or homosexuals in the government. Now, it's important, a lot of your younger readers, viewers don't know, people committed suicide because Roy went, in. this is a serious business. People in Washington who were outed as gay in the 1950s committed suicide. I would say that Trump is going after people and ruining lives, too. By the way, Roy had $3 million of IRS liens on him when he died. He didn't pay his taxes. He was audited for 20-plus years. Is any of this sounding familiar at all? Sounds quite familiar. Now, the race discrimination case, that was their first relationship, an attorney-client relationship. Nothing much happened in the case. Uh, for about five years, and at the end of the day, how, did, how was the case resolved? Well, <clears throat> the, the thing is, Trump ultimately was guilty of it, and Trump was not exonerated, as he claims. But it didn't matter, because Trump put himself, Trump realized what Roy Cohn told him, that the court of public opinion is more important than a court of law in some places. So Trump became known as a fighter, as a tough guy, even though he was completely guilty of discrimination. This, remember, this is the 1950s when this was becoming an issue. But what stuck out, what stuck with people was Trump was the guy who would, would go after people just with Roy at his back. So one of the Roy Cohn uh, precepts from the playbook was no matter what happens to you, declare victory and go home. Exactly. And that's, you know, you and I could have a whole other conversation about 
That worked in New York politics. That worked in Chicago. That worked in Boston. That worked in cities for a long time. Pay off somebody. Scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. The you favor bank. The favor bank. He was an expert at the favor bank. But I wonder, I've really been wondering about this. In Washington, there's a whole establishment of intelligence people and people who work for Democrats and governments and uh, re de Democrats and Republicans. And they're going to be there long after you, the president, are there. The So-called deep state. But he calls it deep state, but it's not. It's civil servants who actually care about functioning government. They don't, they're not political people. And I actually think that Trump thought the Roy Cohn lessons that worked so well in New York, he thought would work on the global stage, would work in Washington. But, Washington. but as you and I are watching headlines today, I'm not sure that that's, it translates to, to D.C. So it harkens uh, back to uh, Army McCarthy, where uh, he thought he could get favored treatment for his pal, G. David Shine, and if he didn't get it, he was going to attack the Army. Uh, but it didn't quite work that way, did it? Well, there you go. So you can go and attack some librarian who works in the United States and, you know, in another country in some little office. But you go after the U.S. Army, you're going after people who, again, believe in what they do, who care about what they do, who don't, even if they share your political view, they don't share your tactics for ruining institutions. So ultimately... It's a complicated thing because Roy was ruined, I would say, or should have been ruined. His reputation should have been tatters, but he did amazingly rise like a phoenix again. But you, that's a rare thing. Usually you can't do that. Senator McCarthy, who was his boss, as I said, was that was it. He was finished after that. Now, you knew him well. Was he ever apologetic about the Rosenberg case or about uh, uh, McCarthy or about uh, the reputations he had uh, smeared? I studied history at Brown. I thought I would have the coup of coups, the exclusive of him saying, I never should have put Ethel Rosenberg in the desk chair. She was a mother of two. She was a bit payer, player at best. I could never get that out of him. To the contrary, in public and in private, when it came to political things, he was strident. He was never, would never say he was wrong. He said, as you alluded to, he would have pulled the switch. He would have, he would have electrocuted them himself. Now, in private, when nobody else was around, he joked with me. I would say, you know, ask him about being gay, and he'd say, "Well, you've seen me at parties. You decide that kind of thing." But he, for political, the political stuff that people care about, he never, ever, ever showed remorse, and that to me is shocking because a lot of things he did were wrong. Going after people in government and saying they're gay, come on. He said that they were more likely to commit treason, espionage because they were gay and they could, be, they could be outed or whatever it was. Here was a guy who could have been outed. He said that. Going after the Rosenbergs, especially Ethel, heinous, disgusting. But he did admit in joking ways to me that I knew he was gay, he knew he was gay. I don't care about that. But when you're well, gay... Well, he did say, uh, I'm not uh, uh, gay, I just like to have sex with men. He was quoted as saying that. He said similar things to me. But, and I don't care about that, I wouldn't care about that, but... When you're gay and you're going after gay people, that's despicable. That's the hypocrisy. He was the ultimate, ultimate hypocrite until, fast forward, we have Rudy Giuliani, Trump, Barr. These people, are they, do they, are they truly patriots? Roy always said he was a patriot. Roy is buried in a crypt that says lawyer and patriot. He was disbarred and he went after his own country. A patriot is somebody who cares about his country or her country despite politics, ab above politics. Roy didn't do that, and I would say these gentlemen, people, are not doing that. Well, Roy had an abiding affection for the FBI, probably for the intelligence community. He felt they safeguarded and protected our country. That's very different from Trump, isn't it? J. Edgar Hoover was in charge of the FBI for years and years, and he was an anti-communist like Roy was. He also possibly was gay like Roy was. There, was, there were questions about how well they knew each other. But... Roy really liked him, and Roy believed in the FBI. He believed in intelligence. Trump is undermined. Trump has made fun of it. Trump is that Roy. I honestly think, as as someone who chronicled Roy and talked to Roy about politics many times, as horrible as he was, I think there was a line that maybe even he wouldn't want crossed. He would not want the president of the United States favoring Russia and doubting publicly doubting his own intelligence agencies. Intel about 
Vladimir Putin. I just don't think Roy would have liked that. Or withholding aid from Ukraine, military assistance from Ukraine when Ukraine was um, at war with Russia. We're not talking about pennies. We're talking about almost $400 million of aid. Roy had a geopolitical knowledge that was very good. Even if I disagree with him, Roy would see that Ukraine is our ally against a Russia that wants to undermine us, just like the Soviet Union did. And yet, incredibly, we're playing footsie with all these autocrats. We, our president is playing footsie with all these autocrats. I don't think Roy would, he distrusted Russia. He distrusted the Soviet Union. And I don't think he would see anything redeeming in Vladimir Putin. Let's go back to uh, this closeted homosexuality. I mean, to be fair to him, uh, in the uh, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, and indeed 80s, uh, it would be very difficult for a lawyer to come out and say he was homosexual. It would uh, really be a, a stain on uh, his or her reputation. Um, and uh, so Cohn was deep in the closet. He was often asked on television toward the end if he was gay, by Mike Wallace, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Tom Snyder, by others. Uh, and uh, he didn't admit it, and he didn't, or Canaletta, and he didn't admit it, and he, and he didn't deny it. Um, and um, so what did you make of all that? Was he just being cute, or uh, was he uh, determined not to acknowledge his own homosexuality, at least publicly? Well, let, let's, since I'm a family member, unfortunately, let's go back a little bit. Roy was the only child of Dora Marcus Cohn, who she put him on a pedestal. I don't think in the 40s and 50s she could have dealt with admitting that her son was gay. It was really something that people looked down on. But now let's look at the, the times. Yes, it was, it was really hard to be a public figure and be gay. I mean, She died, by the way, in 1967. Correct. So did, was he much more overtly gay? Yes. After, he, after she died, my grandmother, Libby Marcus, who was his aunt, always believed in, <clears throat> believed in family, and she didn't care what your sexual orientation was. She didn't care what your politics were. And so Roy was himself after that, and somehow the media covered it up, didn't let it out. But... It, it, what, it must have been a burden, a horrible burden to be gay in those years because the society wasn't ready for it. But it's so ironic that somebody who did witch hunts against gay people, against communists, against anybody who was different, was himself different and, and, and perpetrated that, made other people suffer, but he didn't suffer for it. You remember there was a bill in the city council uh, which would have uh, afforded gays uh, equal rights and, uh, uh, and shielded them from discrimination and public accommodation. And he used all of his political influence to block that bill for years. That bill, had it passed, could have sent a, a message to the country, to the world, that you can be who you are and we accept you. Just be a taxpaying good person and it doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. But Roy stymied it. Now, uh, Cohen had many contacts in, in the press, uh, among them Liz Smith, Cindy Adams. He fed them, Joey Adams fed them information. Had an annual birthday party. He invited uh, everyone in town, including uh, journalists. Uh, Joey Adams used to say, if you're indicted, you're invited, because mobsters attended the birthday party along with judges and public officials. Uh, and uh, he was quite the the center of attention. Uh, but was he really using the press to uh, get after uh, his political enemies? Yes, he was a master at that. And I, my grandmother took, I went to that party. It was in February every year. I went to that party many times. You'd see Andy Warhol there and Norman Mailer there. You'd see mob figures there. You'd see George Steinbrenner would stop by. Young, handsome guy named Donald Trump would come by and pay his, get in the newspapers, then leave. But it was amazing. Roy, and I don't know that you could really do this today for decades, but Roy would feed journalists, and I love journalists, so I want to be careful about this, but Roy would feed gossip columnists information, and he would give them the first thing, and, they, and he, that made him exempt because he was, he was doling out information. Roy knew who was getting divorced before anybody else knew. He knew who was on the take before anybody else knew because, frankly, he had arranged it. He knew whose marriage was splitting up, he knew who was getting married, he knew all these things, and he used that. William Sapphire of the Times, who in many ways was a really smart, was a really intelligent person, 
was totally a devotee of Roy's. Even Gore Vidal, an amazing writer, said he sort of held Roy in awe because he, he got away with all this stuff. And he did. And Mike Wallace, who's a tough investigative reporter, Mike was, I saw Mike at these parties. Mike knew Roy's boyfriends were there. And yet, Mike, in the last CBS 60 Minutes interview he did with Roy, he played this kind of game with Roy. Well, people say you're gay and people say you have it. Mike knew that. I know someone who uh, told me that uh, you're gay, and Roy would kind of not admit nor deny. It was just like the, uh, the Trump consent decree. Right, and I, and I want to just say to your viewers, again, who don't know this, it's fine to be gay. Roy had a series of partners, many, many, very young. And for him to denounce gays publicly is, is abhorrent. Now, he... Um uh, lived and operated out of a townhouse on 68th Street. Right. Uh, did you ever visit him there? I did, and it was a, it was a, it was a lot like Roy, actually, the townhouse. So it was between, it was right off Park Avenue, and the exterior was beautiful. I mean, it's a townhouse. It's I don't even know how many millions of dollars it's worth now, tens of millions of dollars, and in those days, it was worth a fortune too. But you would go in, and the switchboard would be lighting up in in the. Catholic Church would be calling, and some Carmine Galante would be calling, and somebody, Roger Stone would be in the ante room waiting for him. Roy always kept me waiting because I was not an important person. I'd be waiting for two hours. People were in and out, in and out. And Roy, Roy had a room there, a bedroom there. It was his office and his, in, his, in, his, um, in his home. And yet, for all the fancy address, the paint was peeling, the carpet was worn. There was just a sad kind of feeling about it, especially in the last couple of years. Because journalist Marie Brenner called it a fetid place. Fetid. Well, I, I, I could think of words like that, but it was. I would just say it was in shambles. And and then he had. It was kind of a weird. Uh, he had a collection of frogs. frogs. He had a uh, a rubber Mickey Mouse hanging on a, a doorpost. Uh, right. He I had mean, a mirror on the ceiling in right. his bedroom. Uh, I mean, this, these are not uh, normal attributes of uh, or furnishings for a lawyer. Well, sometimes you go to a meeting with him. He'd be having a meeting. He'd let me sit in a couple of times, and usually, usually not, but a couple of times. And there'd be this table of clients around him and other lawyers and partners and paralegals. And Roy would be sitting there in a bathrobe. It was the weirdest thing. And it just was that was a normal thing. He would go up to the rooftop. And he would sunbathe, and people he'd be like he'd be receiving line. People would come see him sunbathing with you know just a bathing suit on, always tanned, and it was just there was something you know I have to say there was something as a reporter and a college student that I found fascinating about this. But also I'm not stupid. I also found it repulsive that people were paying homage to him. Uh, now, he represented uh, mobsters when they uh, were facing criminal charges, uh, Salerno and uh, Galante and uh, Castellano, two of whom were murdered. Uh, but he was more than just a, a defense lawyer for mobsters, wasn't he? He was really a consigliere. That he was, and when somebody named Trump was building Trump Tower and needed concrete, and it was hard to get concrete because there were strikes, there were all kinds of restrictions, well, there, there were all kinds of problems with the mafia. Somehow, Trump got huge amounts of concrete to build Trump Tower, which is made of concrete, not steel. Now, the mob controlled the concrete business, so how did that happen? Roy made it happen. It's, it's a fact, and Trump can deny it, but that's everybody who knew New York, New York then knows that's what happened. There was also, uh, during the time of construction, there was a, uh, a citywide uh, Teamsters strike, and yet uh, the uh, concrete uh, mixing trucks came into uh, Trump Tower. So, you know, on um, election night uh, in uh, 2016, uh, Cindy Adams told me she was standing next to Trump when the result was known, and he turned to her, and this is 30 years after Cone died, and he said to her, Cindy, if Roy were here, he never would have believed it. So I have a question for you. Do you believe that Roy Cohn is ruling the Oval Office from the grave? Well, let's take that. Roy predicted publicly that Trump would be on a national or global stage. But I don't think Roy really felt that Trump had the gumption and the drive and the intelligence to be president. He thought he would do something. 
you know, he would build hotels nation worldwide, and he would do some real estate development. Maybe he may be some of his cabinet secretary, but but now that Trump has been in the Oval Office for two plus years, three years almost, I think that Roy's fingerprints are everywhere in the Oval Office. Everywhere, so much of what Trump does is right out of the Roy Cohn way of doing business, and. Trump, Trump learned those lessons. He learned those lessons from Roy, starting when he met Roy in the early 1970s. And he knows how to distract. He knows how to blame people and choose scapegoats. He knows how to never admit he's wrong. And it's working till now. And we'll have to see. David Marcus, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. And thank yeah. you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Please check out my book, Plaintiff in Chief, A Portrait of Donald Trump in 3,500 Lawsuits, which is now available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your favorite independent bookseller. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.